It might sound a bit strange to be talking about nerves when I know you're really here for menopause, but it is relevant and here's why. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve in your body, reaching from your brainstem all the way through, right, right the way through. And it's a way for your body to speak to itself and it's affecting the activity in the brain, in the body, in the adrenals, in the stress hormones. It's, it's a way for your body to receive information on whether it needs to turn up or turn down different kinds of hormones and neurotransmitters, things like stress hormones and serotonin. So it's, it's all about how good we feel in ourselves, as well as that wider perspective of, of something that we call health. So it is important. Its job is to keep you safe, to keep you out of harm's way. So it will detect what's going on in your inner world and your outer world to be able to know whether it needs to turn up the stress hormones or turn them down. So the issue is that this system, this wiring, this circuitry has evolved over millennia, over times where we needed this quick reaction, this quick fear response, this fight or flight situation that we may have been in in the past. But these days we can still get that same response just from sitting here in your own home. It's not like there are people right now banging on the door trying to come in and steal all my stuff. It's more that there are emails coming in that I can't keep up with and I feel overwhelmed. I've got the the TV on and the news is coming at me and I'm feeling helpless about that. There's people that have expectations around, around their needs, around things that I need to be able to do for them and provide for them. And then I might be thinking about things that have gone on in the past that are still troubling me and I'm waking up at 3 or 4 a.m. and it's it's ruminating and, and I'm thinking about how I still haven't dealt with that. And then also I'm worrying about how I'm going to cope with stuff in the future. There's past, there's present, there's future. It's all affecting my vagus nerve response, the tone of my vagus nerve. It's a totally normal response, to be honest. It is normal, it is healthy. But the problem is when it's being activated so frequently, all day, every day, even during the night, then it's going to start to turn down systems and hormones and neurotransmitters that are all about thrive. So we see less energy, we see more lethargy. There's less digestive ability so I, I might be trying to eat the best I can but if my vagus nerve is getting turned up a notch all the time then I'm not able to use that food digest it properly assimilate nutrients and make hormones from that let alone being in perimenopause and having fluctuations in in hormones and neurotransmitters that affect how my how I feel on a daily basis it can affect my libido, it can affect my weight, mental health, brain fog, focus, all, all things that are affected and influenced by what's being picked up by the vagus nerve. So what I really want to tell you about are the ways that you can start to switch away from upregulating the vagus nerve and turning up the dials on the stress hormones quite so often and start to turn up the thriving mechanisms in the body. And the thing is that this is more about or just as much about maintenance rather than fighting fires in the moment. So I want to share some strategies with you right now that you can start doing today to be able to do this so that you can improve things like brain fog, migraine, energy, sleep, just feeling a bit better about yourself, a bit less off kilter with it all. So number, 
Number one is all about movement, stretching in particular. This is why some of the, the Pilates and the yoga movements are particularly good because it's, it's literally like massaging the vagus nerve in place. And then the other movement based one is about going for a walk, but not just walking, not just storming about, but noticing what is in your environment. Notice what color the sky is, what are the birds doing, where are the leaves, you know, noticing what's going on in that environment, you're more likely to be able to calm this system down. Number two is all about breathing. And I know we all breathe, we all know how to breathe. But it's not always about deep breaths, diaphragmatic breathing. Oh, and by the way, all breathing is diaphragmatic. You can't actually breathe without your diaphragm. I've tried it. It didn't work very well. So what we're trying to do is breathe a bit slower, trying to breathe mainly through our nose, trying to keep your mouth shut. And that's telling your body via your nervous system, via that vagus nerve, that you're in a calm state, you're in a calm environment, you're able to thrive. There's a really nice quote that I'm going to read out. I've got it written down just down here by a guy called Max Strom. And he's a leading author in this whole world of breathing. Look him up. He's written some good books. So he says, some doors only open from the inside. Breath is a way of accessing that door. I think that's a really good summary of what we're getting at here. You'll also notice that if you put your hands on yourself as you breathe a little bit slower, it doesn't have to be deeper, but just trying to slow down the breath, you'll notice that you automatically start to do that and it feels calmer. It's a bit like giving yourself a hug. You get the oxytocin from that contact. It doesn't have to be from somebody else. It can be your own hands. That's probably the best way actually, because you've also got that feeling of protection. You know, don't hurt me. It's a protective feeling. Which leads me to the third thing, which is massage. And it doesn't have to be about you making a, an appointment and going somewhere to have somebody give you a massage. It can be far more simple than that. You can do this yourself by massaging your hands, your arms, your feet, your, your own shoulders, or have your partner do that for you. Again, thinking of, of how we can make this a regular part of life, a regular routine. There's even vagus nerve points on the feet, so you can massage those or you can do what I do and get an old tennis ball and just roll your foot across it or using an, an acupressure mat. Like I've got a, a Shakti mat that I stand on sometimes with my socks as well because it's pretty sharp. So this vagus nerve thing has been so well researched and, and studied and is so well understood now. We have a thing called vagal tone, which can even be measured. And this is done by tracking your heart rate in combination with your breathing rate, because we know that as you breathe in, your heart rate speeds up slightly. And as you breathe out, your heart rate then decreases slightly. You can try it for yourself on, on your own on your own pulse. You'll notice that there's, there is this variation, very small, but definitely there. So that your vagal tone is measured by the difference between your inhalation heart rate and your exhalation heart rate. You don't need to worry about this. Basically, the greater the difference, the better it is. It's a bit like a measure of resilience, how, how able you are to flex and bend and go back to a nice calm state after a stressful situation. It means that you're more efficient in how you manage stress, whether that's happened right now or, or in the past and, and the kind of influence that's got on your overall health. So in general terms, we're saying you're going to be better able to manage blood sugar regulation. One of the key factors that does alter and change and needs support in, in this peri to postmenopause phase. And we have a, a lower, generally having a lower blood pressure alongside that better vagal tone. Again, cardiovascular health, the number one killer for women in this country. We need to be able to find ways to support and help ourselves around this. This is ideal. 
fewer migraines. People who have uh, a better vagal tone have fewer migraines, less brain fog, less anxiety, better digestion and, and using the food that we eat in a way that actually helps provide us with the nutrition and it's not just coming in and going straight out. So it's important you don't just leave these things to chance, but you actually do something and be proactive to help yourself around this. So I've given you three strategies and and we started with stretches and then breathing and massage. But, you know, you could take each of those and find your own ways around that. So with stretches... That could be about yoga practice. That could be about some different types of of exercise that you do. With breathing, you might introduce some meditation. It might even be about singing and humming, using your voice, using this area where the vagus nerve lives. And massage, come on, it's really about touch, isn't it? So think of all the different ways that you could encourage that in a nourishing way. It doesn't have to be massage. It could be splashing cold water on your face, giving yourself a bit of a facial. The thing is, I wanted to try to give you some of the background on why it's important, because I tend to find that when we've got that base of knowledge, you're more likely to to do these things. These suggestions are not just nice things to hear. They're actually going to be doable for you. So I really hope that I've been able to do that for you right now. And if you'd like some more support around this, or if you're struggling and confused about something to do with menopause, then please do get in touch. You can write a comment below or you can contact me at my website, which is angiegarten.com.